Hello and welcome back to another episode of Inside the Asperger Studios. Are you somebody who's autistic and wondering how your brain works? Well, my next guest is a brain researcher who's delved into the area of autism to figure out how our brains work. So sit back, relax, and grab your favorite beverage, and I'll see you on the other side. See you there. I want to believe in the truth, but only see what I'm shown. Got the freedom to choose, but can't decide on my own. Follow what the group is thinking. Bottle up my intuition till it's popping. Yeah, so okay. giving so giving you a bit of my background, I have a bachelor's in information technology. I got online, and then four years later, an opportunity fell in my lap that I got to go overseas to England to go to school for my master's. Hmm. Wow. And then I did something most of us who are ner- who are neurotypical couldn't do. And who are neurodivergent wouldn't do, and that is, I traveled through six countries within six weeks, all on my oh. own. And what was your master's in? My master's was in advanced computer science with a focus in um, computational intelligence. Okay, so you know that you that just in and of itself, obviously, is a very particular skill, right? That's yeah. a very particular type of skill, and. And we know that in the autism community, um, there are more people that gravitate towards that kind of Mm -hmm. technology world that, um, you know, there's been shown that, you know, anybody in uh, in an area where there's a lot of people in the technology world, there's uh, more people that also have autism diagnosis Mm -hmm. or labeling. So and that's in a very particular way. And that this is for me always been about trying to understand the brain and specifically what, what's happening and what, what differences there are. And, and like we say, clearly there are differences uh, between, you know, people's brains, but also the way certain people think and see the world and view the world. And, and there's a wide variety of that. So, you know, that, particular ability that you have to do that is pretty is pretty specific into the autism community yeah i mean it was i mean i can tell you it was a challenge and a half i mean you you take my autism and then you throw on my adhd so it made it made it harder because of the retaining of the information Mm -hmm. and like they always have said in order to hold something you need to keep using it Otherwise, it gets right. pushed to the back, and then it's a struggle yes. to try to pull that information out. But, you know, the, when you look at my work and, and what I've done and tried to really uh, explain, um, you know, first of all, whenever I am working with uh, a, a family or a parent or whatever um, that is on, this, on the spectrum in one degree or not, and, and as we had talked about, if someone's coming to me, Mm-hmm. or they're seeking out my work, it's because they have something they'd like to improve or change in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I always tell them that it starts first with anybody on the autism spectrum is what I consider a left brain genius, right? So yeah. there are genius level skills. Even many of the kids that I work with that are completely non-speaking, that seem like they to others that they don't know anything they know everything it's all there all the words are there many of them can read early and there's this left brain dominance in thinking style and that is what attracts people also to computer technology math science engineering that type of you know personality trait that's a trait right it's a certain cognitive skill it's a it's a thinking style and that is a very strong left brain dominant but what can happen is there can be relative to la- delays on the right side and the right side is the nonverbal social communication the emotional regulation the ability to read emotions on other people to really understand to feel connected to your own body and your own emotions and in fact one of my areas of research has been trying to figure out why some individuals with autism can't speak even though their left verbal language skills are are higher than most people well i mean first off let me introduce you Yes. Uh, welcome back. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Asperger Studios. Today I'm joined with Dr. Robert Mello, 
Welcome to the show, doctor. Well, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Now, we were talking, and that reminds me of a story. I had a guest on, and he told me he was giving a speech about dating to a group of autistics. And at the end of his speech, he went to the person that ran, that, um, ran it, and he's like, no one was listening to me. All their heads were down, and they were looking at their phones. And the person just said to him, no, they heard every word you said. They just don't use their visual cues. They were using their audio cues and they heard everything you said to them and they loved it. Right. Yes. And I, I mean, I've had, uh, I had a 20 year old young man that was here last week and he could type on his mother's phone, but he could not speak and he's never been able to speak. And he would get up and jump and uh, and move around the room and he would stroke his mom and he very rarely ever looked at me or acknowledged me in any way. But I was talking to him and he would type answers in real time to me. So he was clearly hearing everything I said and he responding in very in, in very appropriate ways and really giving me some good feedback and letting and answering any questions that I have. But from if you were outside looking, you would think that he was not paying attention to me at all and didn't and had no idea. So for me, that again is really what I love about, you know, looking at this because it's amazing. The amazing skills that are out there and the abilities. But I also understand how people can misinterpret that i mean yeah i mean a lot of people don't realize that the fact that when they say we we don't have we don't have the eye contact with everybody we don't look people dead in the eye doesn't mean we not, we're not listening no not we at all hear you loud and clear it's just we can't hold eye contact we can listen. i can, can i can i ask you something Reed? Sure. um so you know, one of the things that I often say, and I get people that come from all over the world and have been everywhere and, and, um, you know, and again, I deal with a lot of, uh, kids and adults on the, the non-speaking end. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the parents w would love more than anything to try to communicate with their children in some way or another. And so the one thing I usually ask them from the beginning is, has anybody tried to explain to you or if it's an adult themselves, um, has anybody tried to explain to you what is actually happening in your brain? What is different about your brain? Has anybody ever explained that to you, or what do you have? Have you ever thought about that? And um, no, could you... nobody's ever. My parents never knew. I mean, my story is a little different than most. Growing up, we never knew I had autism. A, we knew I had ADHD. I was put mm -hmm. on Siler at a young age. Right. And then taken off around 18 because my parents found out it affected the kidneys and lungs and they didn't want that. And they tried to put me on Stratera and that didn't work. So I took myself off of it because I felt like a zombie. As time went by, my primary care doctor, my mother's cousins, one was a psychologist, one was a college psych um, psychologist, one was a family um, lawyer, all said to my mom, Reed is exhibiting the traits of high functioning autism. Have you ever thought about that? And it's like a light bulb went off above their head and it would explain things to, to my parents about my behaviorisms and why I acted the way I do, why I say certain things and get mm -hmm. in trouble because family doesn't understand it. So they have to step in and explain. I mean, there was, a story of my mom telling me, you know, you used to take apart your father's tools just to see how they worked. And what's funny is my mind blocked that out. And I don't remember any of that. Mm -hmm. okay. But nobody's ever explained to me how my mind works. Okay. Well, I that's what I've spent my career trying to understand. Okay. And again, you know, if we're talking about, and they're, they're kind of different slightly different things when you're dealing with somebody let's say on the high-end asperger's end of it versus the non-speaking but the the bottom line is that um like i said it starts with an unusual gift where the left side of the brain is incredibly strong and this is a trait that's in the family and we know there's a researcher out of cambridge named simon baron cohen He's shown that, you know, anywhere in the world, there's a lot of people that work in the IT industry 
or in the technology world as a cluster of people in autism, but he also went through family members and showed that there was a higher incidence of people that were mathematicians or engineers or physicists or, you know, professionals. And and the bottom line is, to me, that's a left brain style of thinking, right? It's more analytical. It's more logical. It's more linear. It's more detail oriented. It's what we call local processing. There's another researcher named Uta Frith out of England showed that people on the autism spectrum are incredibly good at what's called local detail processing, but they struggle with global processing or big picture processing. Um, what I've been able to, to show is that with people on the spectrum, what happens is normally the right brain is taking the lead in development in the first three years. And the right brain is really primarily driven by attachment and by social interactions, nonverbal communication. That's the whole idea of looking somebody in the eye or looking in the face is because you're reading nonverbal cues, right? So just like the left brain, there's an area called Wernicke's area in the left parietal temporal lobe that will hear the sound of, of words and syllables and will understand a word and the meaning of the word. In the right side of the brain, there are three areas, one that looks at facial expression and one that looks at body gestures and another that hears tone of voice. So nonverbal communication. This starts with feeling your own body. So the bottom line is there's a developmental immaturity relatively on the right side of the brain and there's actually an advanced development on the left. And what happens is that in people that are autism, because their left brain is so strong that the right brain may not complete its development and the left brain comes online too early and it holds back that right brain development. So, you know, this is where we see kids that are hyperlexic, some kids that can read. Nobody should be able to read really before the age of four if the left brain is developing at the right time. But I, I have kids, I had one kid from the UK that could read at eight months old. Wow. I have a yeah, lot I've of kids. stories that are, about kids young who are able to read at a very young, young age or even identify flags of nations. Right. Or, do or, 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 or at a young age. Right. Or attracted to numbers or letters really early on and get, you know, very, you know, almost obsessed over them. And that means that that left brain skill is coming online too early. And that means that the right brain is deficient. Now, there are specific areas that we can go through and specific networks in the brain. And again, it can be slightly different with uh, with all people in the spectrum, just like it is, you know, no, no two people are the same. But the basic issue is that your brain is very left brain dominant you think in a left brain analytical way but you feel your body and you're in touch with your body but if you have a more of a right brain delay you may not feel your body you may not feel what's called interoception and that may prevent you from actually speaking but you know i've i've spent a lot of my career trying to understand why certain people on the spectrum can't speak because I know that they have advanced left brain skills. Even things like stimming and tics and hyperactivity that comes along, because ADHD is a lot like this, by the way. It's, it's variations of the same issue. There's an area called Broadman Area 6 in the left um, supplemental motor area, premotor area, that when it's overactive, it creates tics or stimming or repetitive movements or hyperactivity or vocal stimming that normally would be inhibited by that same area on the right side of the brain. Um, if we get OCD type behaviors where someone may have to, you know, they don't want things to be changed or they want certain routines and they don't feel comfortable, you know, if things in their room are moved or things like that, that comes from the prefrontal area. The obsessive thoughts comes from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, compulsive behaviors, comes from overactivity of the left. Hyperlexia, reading too early, comes from overactive in the left. Echolalia and scripting comes from hyperconnectivity of the left language networks. 
So we know that that language area is stronger. So why can't people speak? It's not a left brain language problem. It's a right brain nonverbal and not feeling their body through what we call interoception. So this is essentially what, you know, what is going on in an autistic brain at any level. And so this kind of explains it. I've, I've written, I've written a number of papers on this. So uh, you can, you can download anybody. Last year, I wrote a paper really that I think was one of the best people written on the neuroanatomy of autism and interoception and all of this stuff. And it was published in one of the top journals in the world. So, you know, this is out there. Now, how did you get into wanting to help those who have um, developmental, neurological developmental disorders? Well, I always, you know, was really interested in neurology. It's why I got into doing what I do. Um, neurology and rehabilitation was really my emphasis, um, you know, when I started as a clinician. And so I was really fascinated with that. And in the early 90s, um, I started teaching clinical neurology and 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 um, looking at um, you know, brain development. And in the early 90s, Bill Clinton had declared the 90s the decade of the brain. And all of this really new research was coming out about what we call functional connectivity or how the brain really worked on a very intricate level. And I found that really fascinating. And I was starting to teach it and do some research in that area. But then... Um, I came home one day and I worked mostly with adults and, uh, and um, you know, adolescents. I didn't work a lot with children at that time. And I came home one day and there was a woman sitting at my kitchen table with my wife and she was crying and she was upset. Her son had ADHD and they were really struggling with, with it emotionally and school. And, you know, there was some anger and things and, she had tried a lot of the traditional approaches and it wasn't really working and she didn't know she was looking for something, you know, outside the box. And my wife said, you know, my husband knows a lot about the brain. He knows a lot about diet and nutrition. He knows a lot about alternative approaches. So maybe he can talk to you. So that was one thing. But then, you know, a couple of days later, I went to my oldest son's parent teacher meeting and the teacher said, you know, I think your son might have ADHD. Mm. And so the first question in my mind, knowing a lot about the brain was, well, what is ADHD? What is actually happening in the brain in ADHD? So I went to colleagues of mine that I thought might know. So I went to, you know, pediatricians or pediatric neurologists or neuropsychologists or psychiatrists. And I said, what is, what is ADHD? What is actually happening in the brain? And they all kind of looked at me and said the same thing. Um, I don't really know. Maybe it has something to do maybe with the frontal lobe and with dopamine, but otherwise, I don't know. And I said, well, okay, well, someone's got to know. And they said, well, maybe some researchers are out there. So at that point, I decided to jump in and really start researching it myself, really because it was impacting my own child. And then you know, later on, my younger son was actually on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. um, but he was very high functioning. And uh, but, you know, I recognize that that was it as well. So, you know, all three of my kids, my own kids had different issues. And so that's where my personal interest came into that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about your methods of improving and correcting those who have a developmental disorder. Wh what do you go about? How do you go about it? And what kind of results have you had with it? Yeah, well, it's, it's really comes down to, again, understanding what the issue is. And the issue is this, it's, it's, a, it's a maturational and developmental delay and imbalance. So what we've been able to show is that, and we published about seven or eight papers on this last year, is that there's a, a maturational delay where in people on the spectrum, when they, when they have an issues, it's because areas of their brain are kept a little bit more immature. And this is related to something called retained primitive reflexes. So these are early reflexes that we're born with. You know, many of the kids that we work with, they didn't hit their milestones at the right time. And, and that actually is a very important thing. Um, but whether they hit it on time or not, or whether they did it in the right way, 
what we see is that many of them have these things called retained primitive reflexes that might affect their movement and also hold the brain back and lead to an imbalance where, as I said, the left brain comes online and it holds the right brain back. So this developmental delay and imbalance between networks in the right and left hemisphere that really start from the brain stem, um, that is the problem. So what we need to do is we need to, one, remove whatever is holding back some of this maturational process, which is these primitive reflexes. So there's ways of stimulating these reflexes over and over that eventually what we call integrate them or inhibit them, that'll, that kind of allow the brain to now mature at a more normal rate. But then we also need to address this imbalance. And we do that by stimulating the underdeveloped area, in particular, the right side of the brain. And we may quiet down or calm down the left hemisphere because the left hemisphere is so strong. And because most of what people on this on the spectrum do during the day is is really kind of feed that left brain, you know, like everything you do is feeding that left brain. Even if somebody's doing a lot of stimming or ticking or, you know, constantly moving and hyperactive, that feeds the left brain. Technology feeds the left brain. So most of what we're what you're doing is kind of building up that left brain and and it, we need to actually quiet it down a little bit because it's so powerful that we can't get that right brain to come up. So stimulating the right brain, calming down the left so that we can create this balance and then promoting integration within the two sides of the brain so that they can communicate and talk to one another and, uh, and get basically their brain waves working on the same frequency level. So that's the primary thing of what we're looking to do. We're really trying to rehabilitate those networks in the brain by activating them and causing and stimulating growth and development. And then we use, you know, light and sound and electrical stimulation and movement and vibration and video games and virtual reality and cognitive based activities and academic based activities. And then we often are also looking at diet and nutrition and what's happening in the gut and all of that as well. So I'm guessing that's why a lot of autistics are attracted to video games because it's be not only is it a exit to reality and a a um an exit for them, a creative exit, but it's also a way to it's their way of stimulating. Yeah, and you make a good point. So, you know, we tend to think of, or, you know, in the, in the old ways of looking at this, we'd say that the right brain is creative and the left brain is more logical. Well, the fact is that both sides of the brain are creative, but in different ways, right? So the right brain may be creative where it might invent something completely new, or like Thomas Edison was a very strong right brain dominant person. But the left brain can be creative in that it can take things that already exist and develop new ways to perfect it or, you know, do it in a different way. The left brain likes certain types of music. The right brain likes other types of music. But the left brain also likes more of a virtual world. The right brain likes more of a real world, right? So the right brain likes more nature and it's more connected to our own body. It's more interesting, is interested in, in social interactions where the left brain likes to live more in a virtual world, more of a theoretical world, more, you know, of an individualistic type of world. The left brain is a little bit more individualistic. It likes to do things kind of on its own. It may not be that interested in other people. It may be more interested in its own goals and its own, you know, motivation to do certain things or accomplish certain things or learn certain things. And so that left brain being high is you know, again, being driven towards technology because it is technical. It's, you know, there's a certain amount of mathematics to it. There's engineering principles. But as you said, it's also kind of a virtual world and it gives you ability to go in your in your world and be creative in that way. Um, and that's why a lot of people are really attracted to it. But also it feeds that left brain and so it becomes the left brain also is more likely to develop addictive behaviors or really become, you know, get bursts of this large dopamine 
um, release so that, you know, you feed, you want to feed it more and more and more. And the more you do, the more you may prevent the right brain from developing. Now, how do you deal with a client who comes to you who's got anxiety? Because I know anxiety is one of the big things that those of us who are autistic, even who have ADHD, deal with. And there are so many different facets of anxiety. Yes. What is your method of going at helping them overcome it? Yeah, so it's a good point. There's different types of anxiety. So when you say anxiety for you, right, if, if, uh, if, you, feel, if you feel comfortable, when you... When you say anxiety, what 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 do you feel makes you feel anxious, or what does that feel like to you? Well, when someone when I've talked with people, they told me I have what's called anticipatory anxiety, meaning I get nervous when I travel. I, I mean, I love traveling. I've traveled all over, but it's that feeling in the gut that just makes me nervous and scared before i get to the airport and the minute i get on that plane it disappears okay and i, and I have this little mantra i say in my head i say things will get better once i get into the air get into the hotel so that anticipatory is it that you're um is it because you don't know what might happen or is there some sort of uncertainty there or is it because you're being taken out of your normal routine is it, are you afraid that something bad may happen? Are you running any negative scenarios or simulations in your brain? I am not sure. It could be all of it for all I know. I mean, I know, I mean, I guess part of it, it plays into all the stories we hear on the news about plane crashes and this and that, hijackings and and all this. And, and then the minute I get on that plane, it's like, it's all fine. You're okay. Right, right. Look, you yeah. trust the pilot. You're here with thousands of other people. They're flying the same route you are. Right. And then I start to so, relax. Yeah, when we talk about, you know, again, the, the type of anxiety that the left brain may generate or that people on the spectrum have told me is one is the left brain likes familiarity. The light, left brain likes to do the same thing, right? And it's it likes to stick to routines, it likes familiarity. The right brain really more craves, craves novelty or newness. The left brain typically doesn't like surprises. It doesn't like, um, you know, unpredictability. And what can happen is that, you know, when you're stepping out of your routine or you're doing something, you know, social interactions are very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So people may feel people, especially young people, are very unpredictable. And if it's hard, it may make a person with autism anxious because you're not sure how someone's going to react or what they're going to do or what they're going to say. And, you know, so therefore it feels a little out of your control, which can make you feel anxious. Um, again, going in, in, in on, a, on a plane, um, you know, being aware of, okay, I heard that there could be crashes or hijackings or, you know, I'm, I, you can think about, okay, what scenarios would that be? And the left brain is about, it's about prediction. So the left brain is making predictive models all the time on what could happen. And it goes by what, you know, experiences of the past and then projects forward. And so what a lot of people on the spectrum have told me is they tend to be running these kind of negative scenarios, you know, like all these dangerous things that could happen. And they're, they're doing this over and over and, even when they don't want to be doing it, they would like to stop doing that, but they can't <laughs> help it. And that makes them feel anxious. Right. So I think it, 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 you know, some anxiety may be from the unpredictable nature of certain things, certain social situations or being around people that might be potentially dangerous or unpredictable or running these simulations in your brain, which is again, that anticipatory type thing, which is really a predictive model, which is what the left brain does. So what we want to do with that is quiet that down and bring up the right brain, which likes novel situations, which looks forward to unpredictable situations more um, and which accepts that more and which is more, you know, not going to run simulations. It lives more in the now. The right brain lives more in now, right? So what's happening now? Not what's going to happen in the future, not what happened in the past. 
I'm really more interested in just what's happening right now. Okay. Now in the left brain, you know, once you're in that situation, then logically you say to yourself, okay, well, I'm on the plane now or I'm in my hotel and I know I'm safe. And so I don't need to worry anymore. And you're able to then, you know, gain control of that. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, the one time I can tell you, I kind of panicked was, and I'm pretty sure you were, you're a world traveler as well. Yes. Um, is, you know, the feeling of if you got a suitcase and you're going from one airport to another and you're, you got to weigh your suitcase and I'm sitting there and I, and I'm in, and I'm flying out of Germany and I'm dealing with security and weighing and they're like, okay, you got to check your suitcase in over there. It's overweight. You got to pick it up and I'm paying and I'm, I'm running. And just as I get to the plane, they're lining up to board. I'm, I cut my time too short. I misread my times and I was so, I mean, navigating through foreign airports throws everything out of whack because not only are you dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with everything else going on and you're trying to calm yourself and it's hard. Yeah. So the left, the left hemisphere has a comfort zone and the right hemisphere has a comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. We all, we have a certain way that we view the world or the way that we, you know, that we develop habits around what we do. And whenever we're taking out of that, it can feel uncomfortable. And the left brain likes familiarity, as yeah. we said, it likes routines, it likes predictability, it likes to do kind of the same thing over and over. And so now you throw yourself into a situation where you're in a completely unfamiliar country, unfamiliar language, you know, unfamiliar airport, and you know, don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. And you don't know, and you may not know until you get there. So you kind of know, well, when I get there, I don't know if I'm going to know what's going to happen or and so that for somebody that's very left brain dominant, that's going to take you really out of your comfort zone. And that's going to be perceived by you as anxiety, right? Because you're going to feel, okay, I'm not comfortable right now. And yet you're doing it anyway, which, you know, good for you. But that doesn't mean that you're going to feel comfortable uh, doing it right off the bat. I mean, that brings me up to a good point. What is your, do you feel that, if we take ourselves and step out of our comfort zones that we will be able to do better because we're not secluding ourselves and holding off and thinking we're going to be fine. Yeah. So there's to any approach that you take, you know, there can be a behavioral approach mm -hmm. or psychological approach where we could say, okay, well, let's use some aversion therapy or let's, take you to the airport first or maybe you could do a virtual tour of a germany airport before you get there so there's things that we can do behaviorally but my approach is really what i want to do is try to say well why are you feeling that way um, and how can we change that right so mm -hmm. what we want to do is say okay you're the certain areas in your left brain are so high that it's you know, creating these feelings in you. And that is partly because there's a deficit of the other side, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if the right brain likes from, you know, novelty and likes to do new things, like there's some people that, you know, hate routines. They hate doing the same thing day by day. And that's where some people, let's say with dyslexia may struggle with school because they hate doing the same routine every day. They want something new all the time. They get bored really easily with the yeah. same thing over and over. So that too much of that is not good either, right? Because then you can't do routines. You can't sit and study and read something that you may anticipate as boring. Um, so it's about trying to find that balance by bringing up that area where you might look forward to going on a trip and not necessarily automatically think of the negative or feel anxious. You may feel happy. You may actually feel um, excited in anticipating. So instead of anticipatory anxiety, you may get happy or excited about it and traveling. And so if we change the, the balance of your networks in your brain, you will feel differently. Your brain will literally respond differently. 
And so for me, again, that's not, we're not trying to change somebody. We're just trying to create more balance so that you have flexibility, that you can go back and forth and that you're not so high on one area and that that's causing you to feel uncomfortable or negative in any way, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about your brain centers. Um, what do you do there and how do you help people at the brain center? Yeah, so this is what we do. We, uh, you know, do an evaluation and someone comes and, you know, we work with all different types of neurodevelopmental issues. And, you know, one of the things we know now is that it really all starts in child development or even a lot of it in the womb. As we said, it's superimposed on natural traits that are a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure in your family, there's probably a number of people that are also really, really super bright like you, right? I mean, like your mother or your father other or grandfather or grandmother what were they like did they have were they super talented or bright in certain areas um my mom's pretty bright my dad was really good i mean my computer knowledge came from my my father and my love of life and everything else came from my mother okay so you know I, if i want to talk in colloquial terms i would say that your love for technology probably came from your dad, who was probably a left brain dominant person like you. And your love for life was probably, as you said, from your mom. And she may have been more of a right brain type of dominant person and might have been more driven by interpersonal relationships or, you know, nurturing her children or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to change that. That's who you are. That's your personality. And like I said, Anybody that we work with is really gifted. That gift is what it starts with. But if they're struggling with something, um, you know, if they don't want to have anxiety or they don't want to have OCD tendencies or they want to be able to feel more comfortable in certain situations or, you know, we have obviously a lot of the people that we work with want to communicate, want to be able to speak or communicate in a more in at, at all or in an effective way. So what we're doing is evaluating the person. We're doing an, a, a battery of different evaluations. We're looking, are there these things called retained reflexes? Are there in neurological imbalances that might affect different systems in their body, their visual system, their auditory system, their inner ear vestibular system? Um, you know, we get a lot of people on the spectrum that may have imbalances in, in their sense of smell or taste or, you know, how they choose foods. Um, and then we're, um, you know, we, we may also do something called a brain map where we're actually looking at brain waves and looking at the balance of brain waves and looking at different networks. And we can look at different areas of the brain and we're looking for areas that are overactive and areas that are underdeveloped or underactive. Um, and then we're going to put together um, different uh, plan that will be a combination of doing certain types of movements and physical activities and primitive reflex um, inhibiting exercises. We build up core stability. We want to build up someone's balance and spatial and body awareness. Um, we're going to do things that are going to target one side of the brain and the other. In the autism spectrum, we're stimulating the right brain. And there's different types of frequencies of stimulation that are more uh, going to have an effect on the right brain than the left. Like different frequencies of light, like blue light or violet or green is more specific to networks in the right brain. Red or orange or yellow frequencies are more left. We have different lights that will flash at a specific frequency. We have music or sound that will make, will beat with a certain frequency. What we're trying to do is change the frequency of firing of networks. And we do that by using different frequencies of stimuli. So if we use a sound stimulus, it's going to change the frequency of firing in the, in the auditory cortex, and it's going to resonate with that. Um, we may use vibration at specific frequencies. We may use electric current. We have certain um, devices like transcranial direct and alternating current that can go right on the head safely, but it will activate brain cells underneath an anode and it will inhibit it underneath the cathode. So it literally creates a balance in the brain. We're doing bottom up and top down stimulation at the same time. And then we're also looking at diet and nutrition 
and lifestyle as well to be able to try to create the most optimal version of that person and really try to create as much balance as we can to help them feel like they don't lose their gifts, which are tremendous, but that they can get rid of anything that they feel might make them not feel so good or uncomfortable or that they feel that they might be struggling with. Now, that brings up a good point. Um, I've talked with a couple, and I want to ask you about this, a couple of them of autistics who are exceptionally superior in one field, kind of almost like a savant. I had a kid on who was exceptionally well when it comes to the violin to where he's written his own violin music he's world renowned known all over and he's played all over what mm -hmm. makes them different than all the others i mean there is that term of du double exceptional but most of us are double exceptional we're weak in one and powerful in the other but what makes these kids even more better than the rest yeah we've actually studied uh people like that and what's happening is that you know, when they have these extreme gifts, they all usually have even more of a deficit, but it, it's superimposed on their natural skill and trait. So they may have somebody in the family that was also, you know, a good musician or could do certain things. And, and, but what we've actually seen is certain networks in the brain that are for music are hyper connected on the left side mm -hmm. or in a particular area or an area that may be good with math. Let's say, for instance, we had one kid, uh, Bobby here. If you go up to Bobby, if Bobby sees you, he'll ask you when your birthday is. And when you tell him your birth date, he'll immediately tell you what day of the, of the week you were born and who is the president of the United States. Wow. And it, it doesn't matter, you know, how old you are. You could be 80 years old. And I asked Bobby one time, how did he do that? And he really didn't know how he did it, but it just was instant. But he said something about how his brain went back like 700 years and then came forward. And it's a pattern, right? That's a pattern recognition skill. We all know, like if you have a birthday this year, that next year it's going to be, if it's on a Tuesday, next year your birthday is on a Wednesday. And the next year it's a Thursday. And the next year it's a Friday. And so the left brain can figure out patterns like that very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so the part of his brain that figures out that, that li linear pattern of numbers w is hyper connected on the left. But, you know, Bobby really struggled with some other things on the right side of the brain as far as reading social cues or being able to understand what other people were thinking at the time or, you know, not re really um, being able to, to do other types of, uh, of of skills like that like his attention was he had trouble really sustaining attention so when you whenever you see a skill it's because a particular part of the brain that handles that skill is hyper connected or it's really under connected mm -hmm. that either the processing speed is slower so think of it this way it's like some people have a processing chip that's super super fast other people have a processing chip that might be, you know, a little slower. They can do it well, but they may have it, you know, really exceptional. But usually the savant level skill on one side is also combined with a real deficit on the other. So it's like we said, like I said, a double, a double exceptional where you're good at exactly. one, but there's something you lack on the other. It could be social, exactly. it could be math, it could be whatever. Right. But the good news is, is that when we work with people and we've measured this, so we measure like their skill in a certain area and we can see like the deficits and, and a lot of it is a maturational developmental difference where literally, you know, someone may be um, 10 years old and they're performing in certain skills on the left side of the brain at a 20 year old level. And then on the right side of the brain, they have certain skills that are literally at a five-year-old level. And so those skills don't match. And it's just immaturity. And they're so advanced on one side, it's literally holding back that development so that you're really dealing with a maturational developmental difference. Mm -hmm. And that manifests as you know an incredible gift, but also as a deficit on the other side. But the good news is, is that we can bring the deficit up without losing 
that gift or skill on the other side. No, that kind of reminds me, that kind of makes me think of myself in some ways because I'm exceptionally well at doing jigsaw puzzles because the mm -hmm. way I look at it is I don't look at the foreground, the characters. I look at the background and I'm like, and I try, I can match the coloring with the shapes and everything. And that's how my mind kind of puts a jigsaw puzzle together is looking at the foreground of it and looking at its pattern. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a pattern. And so there's different ways that people, again, you have a certain cognitive style, the way you approach something. You look at it in a certain way and you have a unique skill to do that. Whereas other person will look at a jigsaw puzzle and look at it completely different. They'll see the picture or the big picture of uh, of what they're trying to do. Or they'll look at, you know, um, you know, maybe the shapes themselves. So they may look at a different thing. But the question is, why do you do it one way and somebody may do it another? It's just the way, you know, it's built on your natural traits that are family traits and um, and your way of thinking. And we all have that. We all have, we think a little bit more with a right brain style or a left brain style. And, you know, we, we should have flexibility and integrate. We should be able to use our whole brain and they do different things at the same time. But if we end up, if we have an imbalance, then we end up favoring one side too much and we may actually hold back development on the other side. And that creates these imbalances that can be very extreme. All right. Now, what prompted you to write your book about disconnected kids? Well, it was really because, um, I, like I said, the first question I asked as a parent was, what is actually happening in my brain? And none of the doctors that I spoke to could explain it to me. And so I wanted to write a book that would explain this to parents or to individuals themselves that had autism. If you wanted to know what I what my research shows or what I believe is happening and why you're cert why you may be good at certain things and maybe struggle with other things and and understand it, um, that's what I wanted to do. Then I wanted to also give people tools on their own to be able to help themselves to either help their own children or help themselves to create more balance in their brain. And listen, every one of us will benefit from having more balance in our brain and in our life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not meant as something negative. It's just, listen, if you want to, you know, get better at some, some certain things, if you want to calm down other things. So I wrote Disconnected Kids really as a way of explaining what I was saying over and over and over. It also, for me, I didn't have to say the same thing over and over again, right? I you give mm -hmm. somebody a book and say, here, read it, and then you'll understand it, and then come back to me if you have any questions. But then I also gave them tools that they could use at home to assess their own children, assess themselves, and then put together a plan that could help them improve anything that they wanted to improve. And that's why I wrote that. So it's kind of a user manual for those who are autistic or those who aren't autistic to understand how our brains work which is something exactly. we all needed. Right. And it was really for for all of the different developmental issues, right? So at the time, obviously, with my own son, it was more ADHD and then dyslexia, learning disabilities, um, autism, OCD, tics, Tourette's, mm -hmm. um, but also even things like processing disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety. Uh, all of those things was kind of explained under the same model what's called a functional disconnection. Mm -hmm. That is the root cause. So for me, it all came down, what is the root cause? What is actually happening in the brain? What is the root of this? Uh, and not even as a cause, but just, you know, what's the root difference? And how do we, how do we make that work even more efficient? How do we make it better? How do we create more balance? Yeah, I mean, that makes, that really makes sense because we need some kind of a user manual so we understand how our brains work. Yep. And it's, it's a vital, I'm pretty sure your book is a vital tool to all of us because there, I guarantee you there are lots of us out who are autistic who want to know why we are the way we are. Yes. And here you've got this book that says, this is why you're, you are the way you are and this is how your brain works. Right.
And I think most people, when they go through it, and there's a check, there's checklists in there, so you can kind of check off: Are you more of a right brain or left brain dominant, or if you have any deficits on one side versus the other? And you know, in the safety of your own home, you can do that for yourself or for your children. And I think the most common response I get is that this just makes so much sense. There was a famous neuroscientist named Tim Brown who was quoted as saying, nothing in human psychology or psychiatry makes sense unless you look at it in light of brain asymmetry, right? When you look at any person or anybody on any sort of spectrum and you look at the, the, you know, the differences, again, why is somebody so good or why is somebody so much better in this or why are they struggling in this or why am I feeling this and other people aren't feeling it, you know, it doesn't make any sense when you just look at it on the surface. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it from a right and left brain, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense because we know a lot about that. And, you know, some people um, improperly believe that, you know, the, the, the idea of right and left brain differences, we don't look at it that anymore. That's not true. Um, That's basically something that is, um, you know, misinformation that we know a lot about the right and left brain and we know it more and more and more. And we know that that is where the differences come from. And that is where the explanation of the different symptoms or the different differences in behaviors come from. And for me, trying to understand, because I think the autistic brain is the most fascinating brain on the planet. And I think it is also been you know, something that has been so mysterious to many people in neuroscience. And so for me, I knew that there were similarities in the autistic brain as with ADHD or OCD or dyslexia. And I knew there were similarities, but I knew that the most, the most interesting was autism. And if I could really understand the differences of the autistic brain, then I could understand the other ones. And I also would have a better understanding of what I might be able to do to make that even better um, or to improve the efficiency. What's funny is a lot of people do not realize that the term neurodivergent just doesn't cover autism, ADHD, OCD. It's the whole spectrum and people don't feel that don't realize it. I mean, I guarantee you Downs is covered by it and all the other disabilities out there that are de- developmental are all under that one word. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and that's and the, the thing about it is that there's so many things like when you look at somebody on the autism spectrum, you know, there may be a, such a wide variety of strengths and weaknesses. And like you said, some people that might have these you know, incredible savant level skills, even though most people that I work with to varying degrees have these incredible skills on the left side of the brain. Um, But there's, you know, some of them may have also a lot more digestive issues or immune issues because the brain regulates everything. And if the brain is out of balance developmentally, it impacts the balance of what we call the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And so that affects your digestive system, that affects your immune system, that affects your detox system, that can affect, you know, uh, every, every hormone system in your body. So all of these in, in people on autism, some of them have all of these things going on at the same time. And again, that can be overwhelming for most doctors or therapists or parents or for themselves. And so again, for me, I wanted to understand all of that. And I wrote a paper in 2009 that, you know, tried to explain and come up with a universal theory of autism. And that paper, when it came out, was kind of really accepted as as doing that and explained all of the different issues that we can see and how they're related to the same underlying, you know, uh, nature of what's happening in the brain. I mean, for me, Personally, the brain is one of the most fascinating things you can you can actually study because it's our central nervous system. It's everything. It's our thoughts. I once 
I took a philosophy class in college and coming out of it, I can't, I had you know, this thought in my head that said, is our brain kind of like a computer program that our thoughts are the program and our mind and our body are, is the pro is the process of running it. Or is the same, is that the same thing? How can, is the brain the same kind of representation as that? And it was just stuck with me that way. Yeah, it, it, it is like that, but it's even much more complicated because the brain and the body are so intertwined. So, you know, in artificial intelligence for many, many years, and, and even now, even though AI is really good, it still doesn't really, at this point, it's not really like a human brain thinks, right? Um, and the main thing is it lacks self-awareness. Um, and so, you know, that in that artificial intelligence community for many years, they didn't understand why, but they knew it had to do with a concept called embodiment. That without a body, without a physical body, you didn't have, you know, human level intelligence and self-awareness in particular. But they didn't really understand why that was. I was actually asked to go to MIT uh, several years ago to uh, speak to a group about this because they, they understood that the way I looked at neuroscience and the way I looked at, you know, self-awareness and consciousness and the brain, that it explained a lot of it. So our body, we have something that's called interoception. Mm -hmm. Interoception, which develops first in the right brain, which is really connected to our body feelings. A baby from the time they're born, they need to be able to right away be able to explain to the parents in nonverbal means if they're in pain, if they're hungry, if they're thirsty, if they're hot or cold, if they need to be changed or go to the bathroom, if they're tired, um, and sense of smell and taste are very involved in that. And these are come from an area called the right insula and the anterior cingulate. And this is where we become embodied. So around two years of age, a child develops that area of the brain enough where they recognize themselves in the mirror for the first time, meaning they suddenly realize that's me. They gain what we call body ownership. Once we gain ownership of our body and we become self-aware and embodied, we then can have agency, meaning we now can have control over our actions and our body and what we do. Uh, what we see is that many people with right brain delays or people that are so strong with the left brain that they, they may have a, a problem with interoception. They don't feel their body. Um, I've read many, many books um, by many uh, individuals growing up with autism and non-speaking autism who have written books about their experiences. And they say basically the same thing. I couldn't really feel my body. I couldn't control my body, but I knew everything. All the words were there. I knew I was smart. I knew I was smarter than most people, but I couldn't show it because I couldn't control my body. And this has been my area of really focusing on this because this is the reason why some people on the spectrum don't speak. It's not because of a left brain language deficit or an intellectual deficit. It's actually because they don't feel their body. And there's one book by this kid, his name is Ido of Autism Land. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book. But he talks about how he didn't know where his body was in space. Like unless he was looking at his arms and his legs, he didn't know, he didn't feel his body. That he literally didn't feel his tongue. That he felt like he was underwater with no tongue. Um, and we've had many, many kids that can type on a letter board but can't type on a on a keyboard or write but they can type to us and they'll tell us i don't feel my tongue in my mouth i don't feel my body i don't know where my body is in space and if you don't know where your body is and you've never fully taken complete ownership of your body then you can't really have complete agency and that's where all the stimming and all the other activity come from because the left brain is generating these and you can't control it because you, you haven't completely become embodied. And so there's a relationship there to the idea of artificial intelligence and computers and the idea of embodiment 
and what's also lacking in many people. Whereas on the higher end of the spectrum, more like you, we may have some kids that will tell us that they feel too much or they're hypersensitive mm -hmm. to different sensory input or they can't integrate those senses. Like you said, they can't use their visual input and their auditory input together. They may need to use them separately. Yeah, I mean, with me, I can tell you I am hypersensitive to sound and to smell. I can hear things like noise really distracts me when I sleep. I need it quiet. And mm -hmm. smell, there are certain smells that will just really upset my stomach and make me want to vomit. Like what smells would that be? Would those be like pleasant smells or negative smells? Negative what would that smells. be? Like what? Um, <laughs> like dog poop. Okay. Okay. Um, cigarette smells, pot. Things you know, like it's that. interesting it because the 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 left brain and the right brain literally smell things differently, and the basis of smell um, is primarily in the right brain initially, but the left brain usually is more drawn towards positive smells. Um, you know, things like good food that we want to eat. Mm -hmm. And the right brain, we have um, the emotion of disgust, which is right brain emotion. And that is very sensitive to bad smells. And the evolutionary significance of that is pretty obvious, meaning that, you know, our brain needs to tell us, don't eat that. That smells bad. It's going to make you sick or die. So, you know, don't eat it because uh, or, you know, we. Um, you know, don't touch it, don't look at it, you know, all those things is being generated by the right brain. But the sense of smell, we see more commonly that we have a lot of people that have a, a real um, imbalance in smells. I had one kid with Asperger's recently, who said to me, you know, I only smell good things. My family <laughs> tells me I can only smell good things. I can't smell bad things. And that would be a perfect example of someone who you know, even in, in, the, in the whole autism world and in the research world, Asperger's had, had been referred to as a right brain autism because it's pretty clear that, they're, the, that most of the skills are right brain deficient where the left brain, you know, the intellectual, the verbal skills, the ability to be very articulate, have an incredible memory for detail or numbers or letters or read early, you know, all of those things are more left brain. Yeah, I mean, I totally get that now. I mean, it kind of explains to me why a lot of the things with me are the way I am because I'm more of a left brain person because of my autism. Right, exactly. And that's, that is the way it is. And if you chose to, you could, you could change those things a bit, meaning you could create more balance. You could take anything that you wish, you know, if you, there's things that you said, well, I wish I could do this better. Um, you know, by stimulating those areas of the brain. It's like, you know, if you want to get better at a certain physical skill, right? If you wanted to be able to lift weights better, or if you wanted to get a bigger bicep, you could say, okay, well, I need to do curls, right? I need to do curls to get that. Or if I want to get, you know, stronger legs, I need to do leg exercises. If you want to build up, you know, social development, there are areas of the right brain that you can stimulate. Um, if you want to calm down certain areas, so not feel as anxious or not feel worried about certain things or not think about things, or if you feel like you have any, anything that you're, you're, you're maybe oh, too obsessive about, you know, we can calm those things down and, and, and do that and you can change it at, and at any time in life because neuroplasticity is something that's always there and it never goes away. I mean, that's why I always, the games I play and things, I enjoy puzzles. I enjoy games that are story-based. I enjoy games that are puzzle-like because to me, it's what challenges your brain, keeps your brain active. And the more your brain is active, the more you're, you're exercising your brain, you're, you're stimulating both sides. Yes. And a lot of what stimulates the right brain is also physical activity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, exercises, going outside, the right brain likes nature, the light, right brain likes gross motor movement, you know, running, uh, going outside in nature, um, exercising, being around other people, 
um, you know, socializing, the doing doing certain kind of physically creative things as well, you know, like uh, learning a new sport, learning how to play piano, learning how to paint, learning how to sculpt. These are very right brain driven things. The right brain doesn't form conscious memory. So the right brain forms in the first three years. Most people um, don't remember their first three years. It's called childhood amnesia. But some people on the spectrum tell me that they can remember when they were even just newborns or babies. What What's your earliest memory? What What do you feel like you can go back to? Hmm. I don't remember when I was a baby. I can I can go back. I remember my parents telling me a story when I was younger that I had accidentally pulled off the mirror from their car, from my grandfather's car. And the story went, my dad went to replace it with super glue and put it on backwards. And then he pulled <laughs> it off and then pulled the big chunk of the window out. And then we had to call our neighbors who were, who owned the glass company. We had to have them replace the glass. I don't remember this. My parents do. I don't, but I remember uh -huh. the stories. Right. Yeah, I have. I know my my younger son, who I told you was was on the on the spectrum. Um, he remembers when he was like he probably remembers like one like you know maybe two, or even even earlier than that. Um, but the left brain normally comes on after three, and we usually don't start forming really conscious memories. You know, really till four, five, six yeah. in there. That's when most people really start to really become aware and, and remember things. I mean, my parents used to tell me that I used to crawl out of my crib a lot. I was like the escape artist. They told my I remember my mom saying that when I was young, I had, they can hear, I had at my, I had trouble breathing because of my atenoids. They can hear me breathing. And then when I had this etnoids and my tonsils removed, my mom got worried because they didn't hear me breathing at all. They thought I wasn't, they didn't know if I was okay. I don't remember so, any of that. So even something like that, like my question would be, why did you have adenoids? Why did you have tonsils that were big? Why did you have to have them taken out? The left brain activates the immune system. Mm -hmm. So they did studies on rats and showed that if you created a lesion in the right side of the brain, where the left side became relatively overactive, your lymph nodes and your gland, the glands would grow thicker and bigger. Mm -hmm. So the left brain actually increases your lymphatic tissue size. So we get a lot of kids that have big adenoid, adenoids or tonsils. And I've had kids that have had them cut out two or three times and they grow back. Wow. Um, because their left brain generates that. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that even what's going on with your immune system, the left brain being overactive, many people are overly immune sensitive, meaning they have a really strong immune system. We get kids on the spectrum that are often called Teflon kids, meaning they almost never get sick or they don't get fevers or they don't really feel sick even when they are sick. Mm. Um, I worked with, um, I don't know if anybody saw out there on my Instagram, I worked with Kevin James's daughter. Um, I don't know if you know Kevin James, the actor, the comedian. Yeah. And, um, and his daughter, you know, she would get these urinary tract infections and they didn't even know, she didn't even know that would be there because um, she wouldn't feel, she wouldn't feel if she was sick, she, she didn't get a fever. Um, and that's partly, again, that idea of being connected to your body and feeling your body, the same area of your brain that has that immunoception has what we call, uh, that has interoception has what we call immunoception, meaning it also picks up on if there's inflammation in your body and if we have to kick in an anti-inflammatory system. Now, let's talk a little bit about your podcast. Mm -hmm. What inspired you and your wife to start it? You mean my web series? Yeah, your web series. Yeah, yeah the web series. Um, well, we wanted to, you know, uh, every whenever we're working with any sort of patients of any kind, the home program is very important right so we we may work with them in our office but we're also giving them certain exercises to do at home we may work on their diet 
we want to work on their lifestyle. And so what we found was there were certain families and kids that they really struggled with that. We would say, hey, listen, this is the help you. This is what we want you to do. And they would say, you know what? We're trying, but we can't do it. You know, we need help. Would you come to our house and help us? And so my wife and I decided, you know what? This would be a good um, teaching tool where for other people that we, you know, let's go into their home and let's work with the family. And really, because in most doctor's offices, there aren't a lot of doctors that are doing house calls anymore, right? They're not coming in your house. Um, and, you know, so we wanted to do that so we could really get to know the family. We could also help them. We could also, some of them needed some help with a relationship um, or, you know, just some parenting skills. And so we, we started going into the homes of people and actually help them. And at a certain point, you know, people said to us, wow, this would be awesome if you guys could video you doing this so that other people could see this and learn from it. And so we said, you know what, let's do that. Let's do it. You know, we, we spoke with the families and we said, if you guys are okay, we'd like to bring a camera crew in and record this. And, and they were all for it. And, um, and so we did that for two different families and it worked out really well. And it's very popular. I think we have almost 4 million views, um, in, in, in one year. Wow. Congratulations on that success. Yeah, I think it's just that it's resonating with people, you know, that people really feel like, wow, okay, that I can relate to this and I can watch it. Now, even though these are extreme versions and these kids and these families were really struggling, um, you know, that that's not where most families are at. It, obviously, it was a good example. And I think a lot of people found it really interesting to watch. Now, I know you have a podcast called The Same As Your Book. Is that kind of like an addendum to the book? Um, well, the, the web series is, is Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families. And that's the web series that I was just talking about. I also have a podcast called The Melillo Method Podcast, mm -hmm. Everything Brain. And there, that's really going out there with a colleague of mine. And we want to bring you know, really cutting edge scientific information, really talk about really practical functional neuroscience in a way relating it to different conditions and issues and, you know, relating it to the experiences. So kind of like what we're doing now, right? What just what you're doing, but we're doing it, you know, in regard to, you know, what we work with and, and, and the experiences that we've had over, you know, 30 years. All right. Um, what inspired you to start that podcast? Um, again, just another way of really raising awareness. And, you know, in this day and age, I mean, I have a number of best-selling books and my third book, I mean, my, my third edition of my original book, Disconnected Kids, is coming out to, tomorrow, which is August, you know, right now, August 6th. So that new book is coming out. And so books were great. But, you know, more and more people are relying uh, on different types of, of media and different ways of learning and, and getting their inf information and more and more people looking at digital. So doing a web series where we had short videos uh, really resonated. And then a lot of people like this, like really like to, to watch or, or listen to podcasts. So it was just another way of sharing information with people raising awareness, letting people know, um, you know, when I, what I think is really important, answering questions. So it really was just another way of really trying to communicate with people and connect with them and give them some answers. Now, I want to ask you a big, a very big question. Do you, why do you think COVID affected those who are dealing with the, the neurological disorders more than those who weren't neurological? Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's an, an area, functional neuroimmunology is something that I've really been spending a lot of time on. And so what we believe is happening, and I'm going to talk in general terms, and obviously we can get, we could get down to the nitty gritty, but the bottom line is um, people that had a set point of their sympathetic nervous system or their inflammatory system, their immune system was at a higher resting 
inflammatory state before they got sick. And that is usually because in neurological terms, when there are imbalances, the sympathetic or fight or flight system is usually high and the parasympathetic or vagal system is underdeveloped and underactive. And that's called the rest and digest system. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that most people with imbalances, whether it's left or right brain, their sympathetic nervous system is, is really high and their parasympathetic is low. That activates also, and so we know like people on the spectrum are more tendency to have inflammation in their body. And if you already started in an inflammatory state, COVID in certain people would would make that inflammation go out of control. And if people died of inflammation, of unregulated inflammation, because inflammation is destructive, meaning it kills things and it destroys tissue. And that's good if you're being infected or invaded and you need to destroy a bacteria or a virus or you need to kill, you know, infected tissue. But then we need to be able to repair. And then there's the anti-inflammatory system, which stops the inflammatory process. It stops the killing and it leads to repair. That's the vagal system. That's the parasympathetic nervous system. And what we know is that if you're in this really chronic inflammatory state that if you trigger that it's like throwing gasoline on a fire and then the fire can get out of control and after a while there's no amount of of anti-inflammatory that can dampen it and that is why i believe it impacted people with covid much more seriously and there's a lot of really good researchers in this area that are talking about it that way now let's talk about your um your method that you could come up with to help those who have neurological developmental disorders. What kind of success have you had with it? We have great success. I mean, I think, you know, our program is second to none. I don't think there's anybody in the world that gets results anywhere close to what we get. Um, there is a, a decent amount of research that's been published um, by us and by other people independently that really show that the, uh, the results are really great. Um, like I said, we just completed a pretty extensive um, study over the past four or five years that really was a, um, a, a decent size random age match control double blind study showing before and after changes in the brain and in neuropsychological measurements and in neurological examination. And we showed that we were able to make significant changes in a relatively short period of time. Um, and uh, a few years ago, uh, Harvard, uh, McLean Hospital, the number one mental institution in the United States, there was a lab there called the Lab for Developmental Biopsychiatry. They did an independent study of my work for ADHD. And they looked at brain imaging before and after, as well as different uh, neuropsych measurements. Um, and they showed that we got, you know, incredible results and that we physically changed the brain in ways that they had never seen before. Um, so, you know, our results are really incredible. Um, we're developing a software system now with somebody who is a biostatistician that's going to enable us to capture more of that data and show it, you know, even more on a long term basis. But our results are really outstanding. All right. Now, what advice do you have for those who are dealing with a developmental neurological disorder? How, what would you tell them to help them understand themselves and if they wanted to get help? Yeah, I think it's just understanding that um, it usually starts with a gift. And uh, some people are aware of that, that they're really good at certain things. Like you said, you know, you're kind of really, really good at doing jigsaw puzzles or you know and i'm sure there's other things obviously you're you know you're you got a master's degree you're very bright in that area obviously i'm sure you're pretty good in math and and you know and looking at the uh technology piece or that technical aspect of it um but understand that it really all starts with a gift and i think you know, many people on the spectrum know that. And I think that's why they get frustrated because they know that they're very bright and they know that they're talented, but they may not be able to fully show that or because they, you know, are different 
Um, people may not get to know them as well or not give them as much of a chance. Um, but I think that they can, they can change the balance of their brain if they choose to. If they want to enhance it, um, and it's not just about generally stimulating the brain, it's about creating balance in the brain. And everything that's happening, as you said before, you know, every thought, every idea, every motion, everything that's happening, everything in our immune system, everything in our hormone system, everything is being controlled by our brain. And so, you know, you may be feeling certain feelings or emotions, but it's really just certain networks in your brain firing off. So everything in your brain can also be changed. Everything can be improved. It can be made better um, and you can feel better at any given time. So, you know, that understand that there's always something that can be done, that there's no damage, there's no injury, there's no genetic mutation that is causing these things. There are things that we can do to always improve the brain and create more balance. And you never lose that ability to do that. Now, why do you feel that more and more people are getting diagnosed with ASD or ADHD are getting misdiagnosed between the two of them? Well, I think that there's neurologically, there's a, there's a very strong overlap between both of them, right? So there's different networks that control attention. Most attention, four to five different types of human attention are controlled by the right brain. There's an area called the parietal lobe, and there are different networks. There's a network on the right side called the ventral attention network. Um, Hyper-focused attention is the only type of left brain attention, which is the dorsal attention network. That may be different. Somebody can have an attention problem, but maybe not struggle, struggle with, let's say, the social aspects of it, or may not struggle with other, you know, reading emotions on themselves or other people or may not struggle with some of the sensory issues. So they're really similar. They're just different networks or combination of different networks. And, um, and a lot of people are misdiagnosed because there's, they're also a left brain type of ADHD and there's, and there's right brain type of ADHD. So they may mix that up. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, these things can be understood in neurological terms and they can be uh, addressed if somebody wants to, you know, make themselves better and improve the way that their brain works and, you know, get better at certain things and not lose their natural gifts. We can do that at any, at any given time. Now, why do you think more and more people are getting diagnosed late in life? Do you feel like they are suddenly now, because they're older, they're realizing that they see these traits in other people and think, oh, I feel I have these traits too? Or maybe their son's autistic and they're like, oh, I see these traits in my son or my daughter? I think when we look at what's happening, um, and there's a really famous um psychiatrist out of the UK named Ian McGilchrist, who wrote a book called um, The um, Master and His Emissary, um, The Development of Western Civilization and Brain Asymmetry. And in that book, he describes, as, as I've done in my textbook, um, that a lot of what we've seen over the past you know, 100 years and more and more over the past 50 years is we're really shifting towards a left brain society mm -hmm. that more and more what we do is left brain oriented. Um, the right brain really was the master for most of human history, right? Doing things outside, being in nature, hunter gatherer lifestyle, um, socially interacting with people, you know, we weren't reading books. We weren't learning a lot of information. We weren't memorizing a lot of uh, detailed information. Um, but over the past 50 years, especially with the rise of technology, and especially since the computer age, we've become more and more sedentary. We're more and more directed towards detailed information and being bombarded by all of this information. And so what's happening is that more and more it's fostering left brain development and it's not fostering right brain development. And right brain development is also what we see that should be happening in the first three years. And that is really that social emotional development and emotional regulation. Um, you know, when 
when we see, you know, little babies that, um, you know, are infants and the first thing a parent does is put a, a cell phone in their face, that's stimulating their left brain. We're doing things to bring the left brain online. Also, I believe that in, um, in the past, two very left brain dominant people who may not have been the most social, who really liked more to be kind of, let's say, by themselves and, uh, and more introverted, they may not have ways of connecting with one another. But now we're in a society where, you know, left brain dominant people are working together. They're in schools. They're being fostered more and more. And people can connect with each other on the Internet without even meeting each other. Um, and so I think what's happening is we see more and more people that are left brain dominant are having children and their children are an extreme version of them. And so, and we live in a world that isn't fostering right brain development early on as much as it used to. And we're, we're activating left brain more and more and more at earlier ages. And I think that is also causing imbalances where naturally bright left brain dominant people may not be fully developing their right brain and it's staying a little bit more immature and they're relying on the left brain. And we live in a society that drives the left brain and I believe that is what that's what we're seeing. And that's why we're seeing this increase. There's also something to be said about toxins in our environment and increase with inflammation and stress hormones and how that may have an impact on gene expression uh, in the womb and that that may also be having some impact. And finally, where can people find out more about you and your method? Um, my website is drrobertmalillo.com. I'm very active on Instagram where we show a lot of educational or informational type of, of videos. And so um, at, again, Dr. Robert Malillo, um, and also on Twitter and, and or, or X and on Facebook. Um, as you said, you know, our web series, Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, is on a new streaming network called yourhometv.com. Um, I have um, um, seven best-selling books that are out there. Uh, Disconnected Kids is the one that's most um, mo most known. That's we're just we're just coming out, as I said, with the third edition. It's translated into eighteen languages around the world. But you can find my books, and three of my books are in audio book as well. And then also I have uh, um, almost 100 scientific publications that I've written and published. I've published a number of, of papers. And so if people just go in and kind of Google me and uh, in PubMed or in Google Scholar, um, we have a lot of papers that will come up from my lab. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That was Dr. Robert Melillo. I'm Reed Miles, and I'll see you in the next one. See you there. Thank you, Dr. Melillo. Okay, Reed, thank you very much, buddy. Let me know when this is coming out. We'll help, you know, get it out there for you on my Instagram, okay? Okay.